Welcome to Catholic Feedback. I'm your host, Keith Nestor. On this podcast, we connect the eternal truths of the Catholic faith with everyday life. Send in your questions and comments to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. This podcast is brought to you by Down to Earth Ministry, a ministry of stewardship, a mission of faith, and by the generous support of our patrons. For more information, please visit downtoearthministry.org. That's down, the number two, earthministry.org. Let's get to it. Welcome to Catholic Feedback, the podcast where we connect the eternal truths of the Catholic faith to everyday life. I'm Keith Nestor. Today we are wrapping up our three-part series called How to Not Wreck Your Faith. And if you remember from the first two episodes, we're spending time looking at things that can take a person who's on fire for Christ and for their faith and can take that fire and extinguish it down to like this lukewarm, just boring, mediocre experience. And let's face it, friends, that can happen. And so we've looked at six different fire extinguishers, things that aren't really obvious to the world or obvious to us as Catholics that can take our fire down. But nevertheless, if we're not careful, these things can have devastating results. So what are they? Let's back up and and summarize this. The first one, if you remember, was busyness. The second one is people pressure. The third one is compromise. And then last week we looked at your influences. We looked at sadness and we looked at doubt. I almost forgot there for a second. We looked at doubt and we talked about how all of these things in and of themselves may not be something that we look at and go, oh, that's a terrible sin. But yet over time, if we're not careful, these things can put out our faith. Well, now today, what I'd like to do on this last episode in this series is give you some proactive things that you can do to help not just keep the fire where it is, but to help it grow. Because if you remember, we talked about this, being a Christian is like riding a bike uphill. You're either moving forward or you're going backwards, but you don't stay the same. Maintenance is never the goal. When it comes to Christianity, when it comes to your faith, you never want to just be in this place where you go, hey, I'm good. Let's just see what we can do to keep things like the way they are. Okay, that is not ever what we want to do. As a matter of fact, the verse that we're going to use that's going to guide us in this episode today comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, where the apostle Paul writes to young Timothy and he says this. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So when you look at what happened between the Apostle Paul and Timothy, his protege, he laid his hands on him. So he received the Holy Spirit. He commissions him in the in the ministry of the gospel. And then he says, look, you've got to fan the flame of this gift, this fire that's come into you through what I've done, right? And that's kind of where our sacrament of confirmation comes from. You know, our, the hands are laid on us. We receive the Holy Spirit in that. And and now that's when the work begins, friends. It's not the end of the story. Like Timothy wasn't done when Paul laid his hands on him and imparted to him this Holy Spirit and the gift of God, okay? That wasn't where things stop. That's where things begin. And I think that's one thing that all of us have to keep in mind right now. Because what can happen to us, especially in our, our you know, North American society where we feel like everything's all about what we've got, what we've achieved and the boxes we can check and, and the things that we've done, you know, is we can look at our faith that way and we can be like, well, okay, I did that. Now I'm done. It's kind of one of the reasons why a lot of times you see people take their kids up through confirmation in the church. And then as soon as that's done, they never come back. You know, sometimes we, we used to refer to that in my old church as, uh, as uh, you know, if people have that mindset as, oh, well, confirmation slash graduation from the church. Because a lot of people look at it like that and they go, okay, well, I did what I needed to do. I got through those boring classes. I checked my, my box. I did what I needed. Now I'm good. I'm done, right? I could be like everybody else in the church, all the other adults that go to mass once in a while, you know, Christmas and Easter or whatever. But now I get to be, I don't have to do this regular thing anymore, right? Well, of course, that's not what we're going for, friends. That's not the ideal. And if you look at the scripture, you see that that was never the call of Christ. You know, when Jesus called people to follow him, That was an active thing that he called them into. It wasn't just, Jesus didn't just call people to accept a certain group of of ideas and go, yep, I believe that. Okay, we're good. 
And I know sometimes, like, especially in, like, evangelical Christianity, it can feel like that because it's all about, like, this knowledge, right? Do you, do you, you know, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Do you believe that he's the Son of God who rose from the dead? And we put all these things, which are all good things to do, right? But sometimes we can make it just about, like, that moment in time where we were, you know, quote, unquote, saved or whatever. And then it's like, yeah, we did that. And it's funny because a lot of people will place a huge emphasis on knowing when that happened. Have you ever had anybody ask you that question? Have you ever had anybody ask you that question? Well, when were you saved? And can you tell me the exact time and place? Because here's the thing. That's a huge moment for, for a lot of evangelicals because that's the moment when they can go, okay, my salvation was done. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't moments in time where we experience things like that. But what I am saying is that if we get too focused on a moment in the past that we were quote unquote saved or whatever, and that can happen to us as Catholics too, because our answer to that question is a little different than, than our Protestant brothers and sisters. Um, but we can get too focused on, oh yeah, I was baptized Catholic. And then boom, we're just, that's it, right? We, we lean on that and think, well, because that happened, then we're in good shape. But that's not the whole story, friends. And if you don't want your faith to become lukewarm, then not only do you have to avoid those fire extinguishers, and I gave you six, but there could be many, many more. But you also have to do things to follow in the footsteps of young Timothy here and fan the flame of the gift of God. Fan into the fan it into a flame, right? So, so what does that look like? I mean, imagine that picture, you know, and we see um, in our mind's eye, you know, an example in our own life where you've had a fire going, and and what happens when you when you put air into that fire? It it grows, and and that's the imagery that that Saint Paul is using to talk to to young Timothy here. So, how do we do that today in our faith? Like, what are the things that we need to be doing or believing in order to make that happen? Now, what I'd like to do is. I'd like to give you three things that are sort of the ideas that I want to cover here of things that we need to do categorically. And then I want to ask a couple questions and I'd love to hear your answers to these questions, either if you're watching this on YouTube in the comments or, or if you're not watching this on YouTube, but you're listening to it on a podcast, then uh, send me an email to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. And I'd, I'd love to know what the answer to these questions are, because I think sometimes asking questions and wrestling through the answers is a good way to help us to come to a greater understanding. So, okay, so the first thing that we have to do categorically to fan the flame is this. We have to find things that feed our faith because, let's face it, a fire needs to be fed. So if you want a fire to grow, you've got to continue to give it fuel. You've got to put things in there. So what are some examples of things in your life that feed your faith? Now, as Catholics, we've got so many awesome examples of this. Of course, we've got, you know, the scriptures, the Holy Scriptures that, that feed our faith as we read them, you know, the Word of God, sharper than any double-edged sword, living and active, and, and it is powerful. So, so, you know, like Jesus said, I have food that you know nothing about. My food is to do the will of God, right? So, so we, we look at the Word of God and we do the will of God, okay? But yet, what else do we have, friends? as Catholics especially, that uh, fe that feeds our faith. What, what do we have? We have the sacraments. We have the Eucharist. You know, when I became a Catholic, like, it blew my mind that people were going to Mass every day. I mean, I used to think about, like, we had church services when I was a Protestant pastor. One church I served, we had, like, four worship services on a Sunday and then one on Saturday night. And I thought, I was like, man, this is brutal. This is an insane schedule because I got to, we got to preach Saturday night and then we've got four services on Sunday morning. And I was like, oh my gosh, we are abused. We're, we're just like going crazy. And then I became Catholic and then I'm like, oh, oh, now I understand. These guys do mass every single day, sometimes two or three times a day. And I remember thinking like, why, why do we need to do that? And then I started going to daily mass. When I, when I, before I was a Catholic, I started going to daily mass just because I was feeling drawn to the church, wanted to check things out and wanted to experience, like I was just feeling drawn to the mass. And it blew my mind, friends, walking into daily mass. I talk about this a lot in my book, The Convert's Guide to Roman Catholicism, what that was like for me to experience that. And of course, I had no clue about what was going on in the mass completely. I mean, I shouldn't say I had no clue, but, but there were a lot of things that were happening that I didn't understand. But what blew my mind was the fact that, like, especially at the church I attend, on, during the daily mass, there's typically not a homily. 
So I'm like, there's no music. There's no sermon. Well, what are we doing? Because those were the two things that were absolutely non-negotiable in my Protestant upbringing, in my Protestant pastoral world, was you had to have an awesome band. You had to have good music or a good organist or whatever. And then you had to have some kind of awesome teaching. Like, that's why we came to church. And I'd go to the Mass during the week, and the place would be full of people on their lunch hour, but yet there was no homily and there was no... There was no um, Music. Now, that doesn't mean there wasn't any word of God because there were lots of readings from the scripture. And that was, blew my mind. I'm like, whoa. You know, I used to go to like uh, churches that were called like Bible churches, but what they really were was um, churches that used the Bible to preach a message. But this was like an actual Bible church where you'd go in and they would just read the Bible and then sit down. And I was like, whoa. You know? Well, once I became a Catholic, and I started to be able to receive the Eucharist. Amazing things happen in my life and in my faith where now I feel like it's like this fuel for the fire of my soul because it's actually Jesus Christ who's giving us grace. And what did Jesus say, friends? He said that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. So he's saying that, that that's what we need in order to be fed really when it comes to our faith. So friends, I know that you know this stuff, but what what are you doing to feed your faith? So find things that feed your faith and then do them. That's the thing. Now, I can, of course, talk to you about read the Bible, pray the rosary, um, you know, go to mass, the sacramental things. I can, we can cover those, those things that everybody kind of knows. But maybe there's something more for you personally. Maybe there's something in your life that you do that when you do it, you know that this is feeding your faith. Now, I, I can't tell you what that is because I don't know you personally, but like, you know, maybe it's doing morning prayer. Maybe it's, and I'm talking about like the liturgy of the hours, or maybe it's doing something for somebody else. Maybe it's a particular devotion, whatever it might be. I, you know, there's so many awesome tools and treasures of Catholicism that, that we have going for us when it comes to the devotional life and ways that we can have our faith fed to us. It's incredible. So I want to encourage you to, to consider that and, and build those things in your life. So, so the first category, of course, find things that feed your faith. Now, here's the question that I want to throw out to you that relates to this. What are the two most important things in your life that historically have caused your faith to grow? Okay, think about that. That's one of those questions. I'd love to hear the answer to that question. What are two things, the two most important things that have caused your faith to grow? And, and I want to hear what they are. Because I think that's something that you can always fall back on if you find that your faith is growing lukewarm, okay? Whenever you find yourself in that weird place where you're just like, I'm just not feeling it, fall back on something that you know has worked for you in the past to help your faith grow and then do that. Okay, number two is this. You got to keep moving, okay? You got to keep moving. Now, think about fanning, fanning into flame the gift of God. Okay, the gift of God was never meant to be something that was stagnant and contained. Okay, if you fan a fire, um, it's going to grow and it's going to to uh, grow larger because it's not contained. Okay, so the way that that happens is it keeps moving. Okay, and, and in your faith, you've got to keep moving. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. The call of Christ is a call to discipleship. Jesus never said to anybody, hey, stay there. He didn't do that. When he called people, what did he say to them? He says, follow me. Okay. Now you might be like, Keith, that's weird. But think about it for a second. Why didn't Jesus ever like go up to Matthew or Peter, James, and John and say, hey, cool. Let me tell you guys some truth. Now just, just stay there. He didn't do that. And why didn't Jesus just set up shop in, in Capernaum or in Nazareth or even in Jerusalem and say, okay, here's where I am. Let's go. Come to me, everybody. Everyone comes here and I'm just going to be here. So that way, you know, I don't have to do anything. No, the call to the Christian faith, the call to discipleship, friends, is a call to always keep moving. Whenever I encounter someone who says to me things like, I just don't know what God's calling me to do in my life. And, and that happens a lot. And I, I can relate to that. One of the things I like to tell people is this. Well, try something like step out in faith and do something that you feel is consistent with that call from God in your life. And if you don't know exactly what it is, then God is going to move you through that. But it's a lot easier to, to um, direct a moving object 
than it is to get one rolling. I mean, imagine that you've got like this giant boulder and you're trying to move it from point A to point B. Well, if you can get some momentum going, you can sort of shove it a little bit and it'll be nudged a little bit. That's a lot easier than having to start the initial push, right? I mean, think about that for a second. Our faith is kind of like that. When we're stagnant, when we're stuck, when our hearts are hardened, it's a lot more difficult for our faith to, to come alive and to, to, to know what we're supposed to do in that than if we're moving. So what I like to tell people is this, friends. To help your faith grow stronger, take some active steps. Now, I don't mean just like randomly do some stuff. I mean things that you think are consistent with what God might be calling you to do. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're, you're involved in your church, but you're not really doing much, and you feel like God's calling you to serve other people, but you're just trying to figure out what to do, and you don't know what to do. So you're praying every day, like, God, show me how I can serve other people. But God's not like giving you this specific picture. So you don't know what to do. So you're like, oh man, should I go feed these people over here? Should I go clothe these people? Should I go on a missions trip? Should I help clean the church? What should I do? And you just sit in your room and you just pray and you're waiting for God to give you an answer, okay? My advice would be this. Well, just pick something and start. Pick one of those things. They're all good things. And God could be in all of those things. Pick one of them and then just jump into it and go for it and see what happens. And guess what? If it's not where God wants you and your heart's desire is to follow him, then he will move things around. He'll nudge you to the left or to the right. He'll help you get what you're, where you're supposed to be. But what can God do in your faith if, if you're just so connected to this idea that before you'll move anywhere, then you've got to be told exactly what the plan looks like. Friends, that's not how it works. You got to just keep moving so if you want your faith to fan into flame more and more, then, then have an active faith. Have a faith that gets you up and gets you going. Start something. Do something. You can always make course corrections, but, but don't allow yourself to be just stuck. Because I'll tell you what, nothing will, will see a flame go down faster than if it's not moving, if it just sits there, okay? If it's not you're not going, just consequently, your faith needs to be about moving. Okay, so that's the second category. All right. Now the third category, and then I'm going to get into another couple questions here in a second. The third category is this, what does a fire do when it starts to, to grow? And when it starts to move, what does it do? It catches other things on fire, doesn't it? It spreads. So the third thing I want you to think about is spreading your fire. Okay. Now, what do I mean when I say spreading your fire? I'm talking about evangelism. I'm talking about sharing this experience that you have in your faith with someone who does not have it. Okay. When's the last time that you told somebody about Jesus and invited them to come to mass with you? I remember once back in my Methodist days, I read this study and it was absolutely true. And you know what? This, is a, this was a study I read about the Methodist church. I guarantee you it's probably true for, for us Catholics too. The average Methodist invites someone to church once every 50 years. Think about that. Once every 50 years. Now, again, I, don't, I haven't seen the similar numbers for the Catholics, but I, you know, Methodists and Catholics aren't that far apart in a, lot of, in a lot of areas. So I bet you the experience is probably pretty similar. You know, Think about that. When's the last time you invited someone to Mass with you or that you had an intentional conversation about your faith with another person? Now, I know right now some of you are like, Keith, you just lost me, man. I am checked out of that one because I don't know how to do that. I can't do that. That scares me. What if they reject me? What if I say the wrong thing? There's all sorts of reasons why we're afraid of those conversations. But friends, what I'm telling you is this. If you really want to see your faith grow, start to spread it. It can and will happen. Because here's the thing you got to remember. This isn't about the words that you say. Like it's all riding on how well you can articulate your faith or, or say the right thing. The power of the Holy Spirit works within you as you step out to evangelize, okay? Now, think about the apostles in, in Acts chapter 2 in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit comes to them, okay? Um, and, and, and as we think about what happened... It's a powerful experience, right? The Holy Spirit falls upon them. Tongues of fire. Okay, there's that imagery again of the fire of the Holy Spirit. And they are able to communicate the gospel in ways they never would have otherwise. And what happened? 3,000 people that day were saved. 
So friends, if you are seeking the Holy Spirit's power in your life, then you have to recognize that it's by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit's power working through you, that your testimony, your witness will accomplish things that you could never have done on your own. You see, if those, if those disciples would have gone out there to preach the gospel without the power of the Holy Spirit, the only people that would have heard the gospel that day were people that spoke uh, you know, Hebrew or Greek or Latin or whatever language they were speaking, Aramaic. But the fact that the Holy Spirit came upon them and allowed them, read Acts chapter 2, to speak in the languages of everyone that was gathered around them. And that wasn't their ability. That was the Holy Spirit working through them. Friends, the same thing can happen through us today. Now, maybe not literally, but when the Spirit comes upon you, and this is the lesson, when the Spirit comes upon you and you're open and yielded to that and are willing to preach the gospel and spread your faith, there's going to be stuff that comes out of your mouth that you go, where did I get that from? How did that happen? How did I say that? How did I do that? But you have to be bold in that. And I'm telling you what right now, when you understand the power that comes through spreading your faith to other people, you're, you will be blown away by that. So you may say, well, what do I do? How do I start? Well, first thing you have to do is wake up in the morning and pray and say, Jesus, I want to share my faith with someone I want to be a conduit of the Holy Spirit's power to spread the fire of my faith to someone who needs to hear it. Will you please give me opportunities to do that and give me eyes to see those opportunities? And then when you go throughout your day, what are you doing? Right? Your eyes are peeled. You're like looking. You're like, is it that guy? Is it her? Is it this person here? Is, is that, does that person need to know about Jesus? Does that, per, and then, walk, okay, so that's step two. Step one, pray. Step two, walk around like looking, right? And then step three is follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit and be ready for your, what we call divine appointments, okay? That means that an appointment that God puts in front of you and says, you, this is the person that I'm gonna have you have a conversation with today. And when that happens, now you're, you're not afraid. You're ready to do it. Now, you might be a little bit intimidated. You might feel scared. That's okay. That's okay. But do it anyway. And then watch what happens. It'll blow you away. Friends, just the other day, I was having a conversation with my next door neighbor, sitting on their deck, eating uh, a sandwich. And we've never really talked a lot about life and stuff like that. I, I'm just now starting to get to know them. And it's amazing how almost immediately in our conversation, we were able to bring up the faith and talk about it. And I got to share about how I converted to Catholicism and, and listen to some of their story about where they are in their faith. And, and, you know, it's amazing how when you just sort of let God do what God wants to do in your life and let the Holy Spirit work through you, how you don't have to go out and like create these opportunities all the time. You don't have to go out with like a bullhorn and a sign. I'm not, I'm not ragging on people that do that if they do it the right way. Um, but what I'm saying is you see those guys, you're like, oh, I can't do that. So I guess I have to do nothing. And that's, that's not just not true, friends. There's a whole world that exists between being the guy with the bullhorn and the sign and being someone who, who doesn't talk about their faith at all. But yet a lot of times we think it's either one or the other. Hey, how about this? How about you ask God tomorrow morning when you wake up to, to bring someone into your life that day that you can share the gospel with? And I'm telling, and then watch what happens. Be open, be willing. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to know your story. And you have to know what God's doing for you and, and why your faith is important to you. Friends, that's what matters anyway. If you sit down with someone to tell them about your faith and all you do is like, well, let me grab the catechism and just read that to them. And let me grab the Bible and quote all these verses. It's probably gonna go all over their head anyway. Share your story of who Jesus is and how he's changed your life and why your faith is important to you. And oftentimes, boom, that is enough to really begin something amazing and then extend an invitation. Hey, would you like to come to, to this thing with me at my church? Would you like to come to mass with me? Why, why don't we do that more Catholics? Okay, and then when they come like, hey, let's help them figure out what to do. Okay, so then your next question is this. What can you do to help someone else's faith grow stronger. So remember the first, the first question was, what are the two most important things that have caused your faith to grow? I want you to describe them. Let me know what they are. And then the second thing is, what can you do to help someone else's faith grow stronger? And then I'm going to throw in a bonus question. Okay. And this is something that I want you to, to think about and maybe talk about at your parish or with maybe your priest or somebody at your parish. 
I want you to begin to, to question the idea of what is something that the church could do better for you to help you grow in your faith. I want you to really think about that. Like, is there a way that the church could help you that they're not currently doing? For example, maybe you're like, you know, I really wish my church would offer a Bible study or something. Or wouldn't it be cool if my church had adoration hours where I could go and pray before the Blessed Sacrament? Or, you know, maybe it'd be cool if the church had some opportunities for ministry where I could like get involved and help people in a little bit more organized way. I don't know what there are. Now, I'm not trying to like get a bunch of people to go to their priest and be like, hey, here's all these ideas I want you to do, okay? But what I am saying is this. As you, as you begin to think about this stuff, this can become a really cool way to see your church revitalized because you can go in with a passionate spirit before your priest or whoever's in charge of different ministries and say, hey, let me share with you something that I think would be helpful for me and my faith that we could do because guess what? If it'd be helpful for you, chances are it'd be helpful for a whole lot of other people. But then, and this is important, I want you to be willing to step up and help make that happen and lead. Don't be the kind of person who just walks into your priest's office and says, Father so-and-so, I had this great idea for what I want you to do. Okay, I guarantee you that happens too many times to him, and he's probably just got a file somewhere of all the great ideas people had that they were convinced that he should be doing. You go in there with a great idea that you can help make happen, and maybe even without him, and watch what happens. And I bet as things begin to grow, then all of a sudden, man, it's like, okay, great ministries form that way, and, and then, then maybe he'll get involved. I don't know. I'm just saying, like, if there's something missing from your your parish life experience that you would feel helpful in your faith, hey, maybe it's time to get that going. Okay, so friends, I hope this series, this little three-part series has been helpful to you. I hope that your faith is beginning to, to, to be growing and, and, and I hope that it's, that it's something that you recognize, the, those fire extinguishers and you're, you're avoiding them. And now what I want you to do, friends, is like get, like add some fuel to this fire and let's see what happens when it grows, okay? So number one thing, don't let your faith grow cold. This is how you not wreck your faith. You gotta be proactive. You have to take responsibility for it and do whatever God's calling you to do to make sure it doesn't happen. And here's what's awesome. We know that we're not on our own with this, friends. This is not about like all the stuff we're supposed to do to be good Catholics, okay? This is about putting ourselves in the very best position to receive what Jesus is already doing in us and through us, okay? It's not about like us trying to conjure up all this stuff. It's about recognizing the work that God is already doing and eliminating the things that stand in the way and then allowing ourselves to receive everything that he has for us. Friends, I know exactly that that's what you're gonna do because you guys are awesome. So send me some more questions, feedback at catholicfeedback.com. Thanks to all of you who support this channel and me through Patreon. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash Keith Nestor. You can go onto my website at down the number two earth ministry.org. And, and I'd love to hear from you guys. Thanks so much and God bless. Take care. Thanks for listening to Catholic Feedback with Keith Nestor. Send in your questions and comments to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. This podcast is brought to you by Stewardship, a mission of faith, and is also supported by our team at patreon.com forward slash Keith Nestor. Please consider joining our support team. Catholic Feedback is a production of Down to Earth Ministries. For more information about Down to Earth or to bring me to your parish or event, visit down the number 2 earthministry.org see you next time